Well, good morning, church. Welcome. Come on in. Let's get started. Glad you guys are here. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, amen? Amen. Come on in, guys. Guys and gals. I was just thinking this morning as we came in, as I drove in, that we're just so blessed to live in such a gorgeous place. Anybody else feel that way? Like I tell my friends I live in a resort town. This is where people go to vacation. I live there. It's pretty cool. We're so blessed. And not only that, but if you slept in the bed last night and you had a roof over your head and you woke up not starving, you know we're among probably the top 8% in the world as far as riches goes. Like there's so many things that we take for granted. And I just, I just want to give God all the glory for all of it because we are right where he wants us to be. Could you guys stand? We've got so many things happening this morning as well. Just signs that God is working, God is moving in our town, in our little church. I wonder if you maybe this week felt God move in your own life. If there were times or there were moments that maybe he was moving, maybe you haven't been aware of. But God is moving. He's here with us. He inhabits the praises of his people. As we lift our voices together and we sing to him, he is honored and glorified. So let's lift our voice together with one voice as the bride of Christ this morning, church. Amen. God, we worship you. Lord, we surrender to you. God, we ask that you have your way this morning. God, we thank you for the evidence of new life, the baby dedications and baptisms. And God, you are on full display this morning, God. As we sing these songs, Lord, I pray that it just wouldn't be words coming out of our lips, but we would sing these with our hearts every inch and every ounce of who we are, declaring your glory, bringing you praise and all the honor you deserve, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love that never ends, never fails us, God. We love you, Lord, and we surrender our hearts to you now as we sing these words in Jesus' name. Feel free to clap, feel free to dance. Feel free to lift your voice, lift your hands. Let's celebrate God this morning. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Let's sing these words together to God. There are walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. Thank you, Lord, broke them down. There are chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound, no longer bound. That's good news, amen. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the night, you call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Sing, feel the darkness shaking, feel the darkness shaking, all the dead coming back to life, back to life. And hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the night. Call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive, oh what? 
Because of the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger.
of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when struggling see, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I sing, amen. God, 
Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. I pray that every heart in this room would be transformed by you this morning, God, so that no one could walk out the doors the same as we came in, God. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, and God's people say, amen. You guys may be seated. Hey, this is really fun. We're going to do something very exciting here in just a minute, and it's called a, a baby dedication. It's the most risky thing you can ever do in a church, and we're going to do it. So what are we doing? What does it mean to dedicate babies to the gospel, to Jesus? First of all, what it doesn't mean is that from this day forward, these babies know Jesus. It doesn't mean that at all. One day, each of these children that are going to be up here will have to make this decision on their own. The decision to follow Jesus is a personal one, and we all have been given this responsibility to choose to, to follow after Jesus or to not. So they will have to make that decision on their own. But some things can make that, that decision rather difficult. For instance, I've time and time again, I see so many people walk away from the church. And do you know why they do? Number one reason often is, I hate to say this, but because of the church. Something really bad happened in their church experience that they said, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm out of here. And I, I want you to know, when we dedicate these babies, what we're really doing is we are dedicating ourselves to love these little ones as they grow up. And if they are loved, guess what they can't de deny when they go off? They can't deny the love of Christ because they, they felt it every week they were in church. They felt it whenever they were around followers, the followers of Jesus. They know it's real. So we're committing ourselves to saying, hey, we are committed to these children. And what matters more, more than children, honestly? Karen knows nothing. This woman <laughs> has dedicated herself, and she is, it's so amazing that she, she's, she is all in, and she makes our children's program and our relationships here work in this church. And that's, to me, I can't even imagine doing that, but thank you, Karen, for doing that. <clears throat> And it's interesting because we tend to think in our own minds, the people who are most important are our peers or even those who are a little bit older. Those are the ones we want respect from. And so when Jesus was, um, these parents were like really irritating Jesus, according to the disciples, because they were all bringing their little babies and handing them to Jesus. And Jesus would take them and he would bless them and he would pray for them. And the disciples honestly believe Jesus is too good to be wasting his time and energy on like worthless little children that can't do anything yet. And what did Jesus think about that? We actually, it was one of the times he was really, well, several times, one of the many times he was actually very harsh on the disciples. And he says, no, you let the little children come to me. And so that's a, that's a decision we're making um, today. Are we going to really let these children come to Jesus, see Jesus, know Jesus from the faces and the expressions and the love that we show these kids? And that means a lot of patience. It also means, for me, learning names. And so um, anyway, I, I've already, let me see if I get these right. Ready? Ari, Ames, Ezekiel. Boaz and Josephine. So I learned five names. And if, okay, if I can do that, I want each of us, as, as these families now, come on up families, bring your, bring your children. I want everybody to really focus in on maybe one child, one name, and say, I am going to track with that child as they grow up. I'm going to get to know that child. And and if we will all be doing that, guess what? This will be a place where kids come to be loved. And that's what we want Sisters Community Church to be. So come on up here, you guys. Come up here. Not only mom and dad are here, but if you're a family member, okay, and you love these guys, your family member, come on up with them right now. Come on up. Um, so there's other family members who are here. Now, here's another thing. Um, 
This is really fun. So we're going to go down. I'm going to ask this question. Okay, again, we're going to get the names. The names I just memorized, I don't have them attached to people yet, except for Josephine, okay? <laughs> so we're going to get the names of these children. And then also, I want the parents to just say one unique quality, something unique about each child. They didn't know I was going to ask this. So, um, so um, we're going to pass this down and just, would you tell us the child's name that's being dedicated today and some, something unique, unique that you've noticed. There you go. Hello all. Uh, this is Ari. He is two and he is just amazingly loving and caring, that young boy. And then this one here is Ames. He's our youngest. And he's two months, and he is in love with his big brothers. Hello. Um, we have uh, Ezekiel, Bruce, and we have, uh, well, Boaz. <laughs> Boaz Casey. Um, so Ezekiel is, he's three, and he is, uh, he is our, in a week, yeah. And he is our, um, he's very curious. He's very kind of calm. He's kind of got the middle brother thing going on, um, and, but he has such a beautiful little heart and a beautiful little mind, and he, you can even see him now. He's processing everything. So, um, and then Boaz, Boaz Casey is, um, he is... He'll be three months tomorrow. Three months. Three months old tomorrow, and he just has a really sweet, tender spirit and um, also loves his brothers. Loves the ceiling fan. <laughs> All right, we have here Felicity, Gabriel, and Josephine, the youngest. Uh, Felicity is four and a half, and I think something unique about her is that she's very curious, very sweet little girl. Uh, she loves picking out her outfits for church. Gabe here is two and a half, and he's also very sweet, uh, very playful, rambunctious little guy when we're at home. And then Josephine is our youngest. She's six weeks old. Uh, and she is just starting to perk up and look at the world. And she's got a beautiful smile. So there's a gift here. And Karen's going to tell us about what's here that we have for each of you. It's such a joy to be able to be here with these families. And we have um, a Jesus storybook Bible for each um, child that's being dedicated, and then also a certi certificate that goes along um, for this great day for you. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Elders, come on up here. And then um, here's something else. I want. If you know one of these families, if you personally know, then come on up here and lay hands on as well. And everybody, please rise. And um, so... Everybody, please rise and then put your hand on the person in front of you and let's just all connect as a church. Hey, can we get all of you guys to just, just even crowd? Come on up here and pray. Yeah, just come on up and, and you guys, anybody's welcome to come on up here and put hands on and we're going to pray. I'm going to. I'm going to stick this um, mic back here to Ryan, and he's going to pass it among some elders as we pray. All right. I'm going to pass the mic to a couple elders. I'll start. Father, thank you for these families. God, thank you that they've decided they don't want to raise their kids, not just without the gospel, but without the body of Christ, the church. I pray, God, that this church would be beautiful in its relational care and concern for these children. God, I pray for those of us who are further along would commit to loving, knowing, serving, and developing these young people. God, we pray that divine grace would come and protect these little ones from a world that has lost its way. God, save them not just from the world, save them from themselves and the this, this sin that wants to self-deceive them. So God, thank you for the Millers and the Kelsos and the Hare family. Please bless these families. Thanks for these children, Lord. Such is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I thank you for the parents who are here 
make a public demonstration of dedicating their children to you and their lives to you and their lives to each other that they might raise them in the fear and the admonition of you because we know that if they are brought up in the way that they should go when they're old they'll not depart from it so father i pray for each one of these couples that are represented here that you would just ground them in you and their faith in you that they might raise these children to be disciples and followers of you prayer is that you would teach each one of these parents how to be good listeners that they would hear not just the words of their children but the hearts of their children and that they would walk with them in the journey god thank you for listening to us and thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so watch over them i pray in christ's name lord we thank you for karen and how she's helping us to love these kids better Thank you for her love. And Lord, I thank you for each of these parents. Oh, Father, the wisdom that is needed. I can't, I mean, it's infinite and we don't have it, but you do. So we pray for these parents that they would cry out to you, that they would look to the wisdom from others who've gone before them. Lord, that we would come around them with prayer. And Father, would we look at these kids as the most precious thing that we have as a church. And then if we don't do them right, then we mess up in everything. Um, so help us be an example of Jesus. May they see the love of Jesus whenever they step into this place, whenever they step into any of our presence. May they understand and see and know that Jesus loves them because we love them well as a church body and as individuals of that body. So thank you for this time, and we just rejoice in young life. And Lord, we ask that in your just sovereign plan and grace, that your hand would be on each of these children, and that each one of them one day would bend the knee and ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and guide of their life. And that may they just grow up to be disciples of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Will you um, grab me my Bible and my notes? All right. Thank you, Jonathan and Karen and families. That was awesome. And kids are dismissed. So good energy. Josh, Josh, little Josh, he's got more fire than anyone in this church. I know, man. I, if you've ever seen that guy, he goes hard. It's wonderful. All right. Well, good morning. Really glad you're here. I'm Ryan, one of the pastors here, and, and grateful you're here this morning. And uh, we got more fun coming. Um, so it's so fun to see the babies and the natural birth and uh, the church growing that way through uh, multiplication. But this morning, we're also going to celebrate baptism. And so I just want you to be thinking as you're listening, maybe you're here this morning, we have some people who proactively said, hey, I want to be baptized. But maybe the word of God would hit you this morning in a way you go, I didn't sign up, but I need to be baptized. So we have two baptisms planned. If we do any more than two, great. So at the end of the service, when we say, who wants to be baptized? And uh, the spirit speaks to you and you didn't sign up, you just walk on up, okay? Sound good? Great, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the chance to gather with the people of God. We pray that you would be real big this morning, Jesus. That would just been my prayer. Jesus, be big. Be big in conviction where we need it. Be big in encouragement where we're weak. Be big in correction where we've gone astray, be big in grace, where we're smashed by guilt and shame. God, I need your help this morning. I'm unable, but you're more than able. So do what only you can do. Thank you for what you're doing in this church. Thank you for the joy of seeing these families. Thank you for the joy of these stories we're going to hear later from those being baptized. God, you must increase. 
I pray me and all of us decrease in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you have your Bible, open it up to 1 John chapter 1. And last week, Steve opened up the epistle of John for us. And he said a lot of good things, but the, the thing that I most resonated with that I thought, that's gold. We got to hold on to that. Steve talked about how John was teaching both an objective truth. If you remember how the epistle starts, it, it actually starts with John saying, we've actually heard, we've seen with our eyes, we looked upon and we touched with our hands. We, we touched this guy, Jesus. There was an objective reality in what the apostle whom Jesus loved wants to see happen in this church is he wants the objective reality to become a subjective experience. He wants the gospel embodied in a community. And so this morning we're going to look at verses 5 to 10, and I want to read them out loud, and then we're going to dive in. He says this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. He says, this is the message that we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of, his, of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. Whether you love the Reformation or Reformed theology, it's undeniable that there were seeds of the church born in some of those confessions. And one of them came from Martin Luther in 1517. He said this, he said, when our Lord Jesus said, repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be one of repentance. And I just want you to think about how much this idea of confession and repentance actually marked the Reformation. This was a revolutionary concept that sparked a movement all through Europe, and it changed, actually, the power dynamics in the church. The, the Catholic Church, if you remember, it was, it was grace via indulgences. The uh, pastors learned how to make a pretty good salary off people's guilt. There's a lot of guilt. It pays well. It, but this threat of power actually disrupted the Catholic Church. What Luther was saying is that actually little people, common folk, the down and outers, the nobodies in life, they're actually invited into a spiritual life that subverted the power structures of the day. And it actually is so simple that we often need to be reminded. What Luther was saying is this, it's our confession before God that invites the grace of God into the life of the believer. And so let me just ask you a question this morning. How often do you find yourself saying the words, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? The core confession of our faith as followers of Jesus, all of us started, all of us in here came to Christ because we came to a point in life where we realized, I'm wrong. The way I'm walking, it's wrong. The beliefs I have about God, self, and others, they're wrong. The behaviors I'm engaging in are not producing the abundant life. And so we got to a point where we said, I'm going to come to an end of myself and I'm going to confess, I am wrong. And so we come into the church, all of us, 
by saying, I need help. That's how we ended up here today. But what ends up happening is we get into the church, and I would say we get churched into a life of self-dependence. We get formed out of this life of confession, and we get formed into this new life of self-righteousness, self-justification, self Exaltation, self-importance, trying to be right. And what this passage is saying to us, he's saying, if we're going to be the people in community that are subjectively creating a culture and an environment where gospel proclamation is felt in gospel community, then the, the secret sauce, the glue of that kind of culture, you know what it's going to be? It's not going to be performance. It's not going to be achievement. It's not going to be good little boys and girls. It's going to be confession. John wants this group of, of believers to actually become a confess, confessional community. Now, I just want to show you a, a Venn diagram of the gospel of uh, the, not the gospel, the, the epistle of John. And uh, this is an interesting little diagram here I want to show you. But what you see in uh, John's epistle is that there's actually three themes that he almost just keeps cycling through. So he'll talk for a little bit about, like, the, the text this morning. He's going to talk about walking in the light. He's going to talk about practicing the truth. He's going to talk about embodying this in our moral life. So part of what John's going to repeatedly say is the gospel actually has to work in our personal morality, okay? But if you just have personal morality, that's insufficient. And then he's going to talk about how actually there are certain doctrinal norms and doctrinal truths that he wants the people of God to affirm. He's going to talk actually about false teachings about Jesus in this letter. He's going to talk about those who went out from among us because they weren't of us. And he's going to point to doctrinal error. And so he wants it to be a, a, a moral community, but he also wants the, the church to be a doctrinal community. But here's, the, here's the, the kicker. If we say we love God, but we hate our brother, <laughs> 1 John 2 and 3 says it twice. The truth is not in us. He wants it to be a relational community. And so oftentimes in, in different churches or different discipleship models, we kind of focus on one like, oh, let's be the moral reformed people of God. Well, the, yes, but if we do it apart from being a relational people, we missed it. Or if we're doctrinally competent, but we're morally impure, it's going to create some problems. So, so this letter is massaged with these three themes over and over and over and over again. And I would encourage you to actually just to read 1 John five chapters and just write in your Bible, oh, doctrinal test. Oh, relational test. Oh, moral test. You're going to find them cycling over and over and over again. All right, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Here we go. This is the message that we have heard and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. The gospel is news, not advice. This is the news we proclaim to you. And notice the proclamation isn't about us. We live in a very humanistic age. We tend to read ourselves into everything. We tend to want to make every story about ourselves. And the news that comes isn't about us. It's about God. God has done something about the horrific and painful disillusioning human experience. God has come. We saw with our eyes. We heard with our ears. We touched with our hands. And this news... If you go back to verse 4, 
John says, the reason I'm, I'm writing you about this news, the reason I'm writing to you about this Jesus and what he's done is that I want your joy to be complete. And so there's actually two God is statements in John's epistle. The first one is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. God is light. And this has to do with God's... Uh, it has to do with the, the doctrinal part of the call. Uh, light in scripture is often synonymous with truth. If you go into the Psalms, the psalmist will say, send out your light and your truth. Light is synonymous with truth, but it's also synonymous with God's moral perfection. So God is light is the first God is statement in First John. Does anyone know what the second God is statement in First John is? God is love. That's 1 John chapter 4 verse 8. And so you got God is light that frames up John's epistle. Then you got God is love. And guess what light and love, guess what three dimensions that has to do with us? It has to do with the doctrinal, the moral, and the relational. In other words, what he's calling the community to be is simply an embodiment of who God is. We're not creating this stuff ex nihilo out of nothing as God to us, so us to one another. God is light, and we need this revelation that God comes into the darkness. I'm reminded of the interaction in, in, uh, uh, with Nicodemus in John 3. Right? Remember the story of Nicodemus where he says to Nicodemus that people love the darkness because their deeds were evil. So light is both illuminating and it's simultaneously threatening. Now hold on to that because that, are we going to allow the light this morning, are we going to allow it to be illuminating? Or are we going to allow it to be threatening? Okay? There's going to be a triad of three errors, three, three wrong thoughts. Verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10. Okay? We don't have to guess what the, uh, we don't have to guess what the heresies were going on. John just kind of bakes it into the passage for us. Okay? He's going to say three times if we say, and he's going to quote, common language that was happening in the church that he wants to correct, okay? So verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10. Here's the three triad uh, of errors. First error, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. So the first error is the error of hypocrisy. Brendan Manning has this great quote. He says, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. That's what Jonathan was talking about up here, that he's seen a lot of young people deconstruct their faith. Why? Because the church talks about grace, but doesn't practice it. Or the church talks about holiness, but doesn't actually live it. Think how much damage has been done in the church, by the church, because there's not gospel integration. What John wants for this church is actually the gospel, not just to be a set of doctrines. Do you notice he says in verse 6 that the truth isn't something we just believe. It's something we walk in. We walk in the truth. And far too often what we've done in the evangelical church is what we, we've just simply said, do you believe these things? That's great. But to believe in the Bible is to do. It's to walk in. Jesus gets done with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and he has this radical teaching, right? And we got some of those teachings on our walls here. These are the uh, Beatitudes on our walls. But this very radical teaching. 
Okay? And at the end of it, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hear the words of mine and what? Do them. Oftentimes, what I found is that we have a, a church culture that says, Blessed are those if you theologically believe in these things. Who cares if you do them? Friends, the truth is made for us to walk in it. And when we have a gospel doctrine that lacks gospel culture, when we have beliefs that don't match behavior, when we have doctrine and, and no embodiment of that, disillusionment is around the corner. Deconstruction is around the corner. Randy Alcorn used to always say, when someone's public persona outweighs their private life, destruction is around the corner. And so I'm reminded of what Tim Keller said. He says, our real religion is what we do with our solitude when nobody else is watching. Isn't that good to just think about, how am I, how am I doing when it's just me and God? <laughs> am I walking in the truth? What's my mental script? What are the most enlivening thoughts I have when it's just me and nobody else is around? What's, what's the motivating life script of my life? So the first error he wants to correct is his error of hypocrisy. Second error, verse 8, man, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. This is the error of an overly optimistic view of human nature. This is the view that says, yeah, everyone's basically good. We're all good. Um, scripture comes and says, no, we're all flawed. We're all, Romans would say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Does that mean, now, I'm not going to get into the debate of like, does that mean it, people are only all bad? I, I don't think so. But we're not going to get into that debate right here. But if you want to talk about it later, we can, okay? He wants to correct this overly optimistic view of human nature. These kids were up here, and uh, I was just thinking, do we have to teach any of those kids the word mine? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> if you don't know, go work with Karen next week and the three-year-olds. If we don't understand human nature, John says we actually are self-deceived. And so there's this tension. Do you see the tension baking into this text right now? God is light. I'm going to pretend that he's not light, or I'm going to pretend I don't need his light. I'm going to pretend I'm a little better than I am. I have no sin. And John's saying that's not how you solve that tension. We don't solve the tension by pretending we're light. That's not how the tension is going to get solved, okay? And then the third error is in verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, this is an overly optimistic view of human behavior. The first one's about nature. I'm not a sinner, identity. Verse 10, it's about my behavior. I didn't sin. It's the error of an overly optimistic view of human behavior. So what do we do with this tension well, we don't pretend we're better than we are with hypocrisy. We don't pretend we're the light. And we don't pretend that we only walk in light. Verse 10, what do we do with the solution that God is light? There's two antidotes baked into the text, and they're, it's the gospel. Verse 7, he says, but this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son, Jesus, cleanses us from all sin. 
I love what C.S. Lewis said about this idea of God is light. Listen to what he says. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Lewis saw the God is light reality as actually a fundamental apologetic of how his conversion story happened. And instead of pretending that God was somehow less light, let's just shave off a little bit of his moral perfection. Let's, sit, let's shave off some of the intimidating parts of the light. Lewis actually came to see God as light as part of the gospel proclamation. God as light is actually good news. That's good news. And we can walk in the light and practice the light and when we do, John says, what happens in the community is that you start having fellowship with one another. And why is that? Here's why. If we're walking around in the church and we're pretending with one another, pretending's the soft word. What's the biblical word? What are we doing? We're what? Lying to one another. And when you live in a culture of lies, actually, John says in his gospel, he says, Satan is a liar from the beginning, and when we lie, we speak his native tongue. So think about this. We're the church of Jesus, and we use the language of Satan. That's bipolar. What John wants it to see happen is he wants to see a church increasingly inviting the light in. So Henry Cloud, a, a great Bible psychologist guy, has this really great teaching out of the book of Proverbs. Go YouTube, Henry Cloud, Wise, Foolish, and Evil. And he tracks three uh, characters in the book of Proverbs. And all three characters in the book of Proverbs, the light comes to them, but there's three responses to the light, and the light is the truth. The light is the revelation, it's the self-revelation of who you really are, okay? Uh, there's three responses, wise, foolish, and evil, in the book of Proverbs. You know what the wise person does when the light comes? They're thankful, they're like, oh, that's great to have light. I'm gonna adjust who I am based on the light. The foolish person, you know what they do? They try and find a dimmer switch. Turn it down a little bit. You know what the evil person does in the book of Proverbs? Light comes on, they grab a baseball bat, start breaking light bulbs. Okay? So our response to this idea of God is light is absolutely critical in understanding the gospel. So I want to show you. Uh, I want to show you a chart, and uh, this chart is a really good one. It, it was written actually by a group of uh, missionaries, World Harvest Missions. They were sending out all these young people um, to go change the world. You know, remember when you were twenty something and you, you were like, "I'm going to change the world." Then you got to thirty, and you're like, "I can't even change myself." And then you're like, "Get to my age," and you're like, "Somebody change me." Um, I don't know what happens at fifty, but. Based on looking at Steve, I'm, I'm, pr I'm prayerful about the future. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Um, I, want you, I want you to see this chart. This is uh, the chart that they created. And uh, what you see in this chart is you see a moment where you've gone from lost, and then you got two things going like this. That's conversion right there. Okay? And the rest of your life is this idea that you're growing in your relationship with God. This is a growing awareness of God's holiness. God's not becoming more holy, but we are growing. None of us have arrived. It's the journey the rest of your life. Uh, down here, is, it's a growing awareness of my own sinfulness. It's not that I'm becoming more sinful, but what I'm starting to do as I grow in Christ is I'm realizing my flaws are really deep. Tim Keller says, you'll know you're a Christian when you stop repenting for the bad things that you do and you start repenting for the good things that you do for the wrong reasons. One of my old pastors, Stu Weber, says, 
he goes, said one time, literally, I've never done anything in my life with a pure motive. And I was like, even that quote, Stu, you were trying to get people to like you, right? <laughs> wow, he's trying to appear humble. Oh, man, right? All right, so, so what, what happens on this chart here? Uh, two things. First thing that happens is we backfill the gap. The cross stays small. We backfill it with self-justification. I'm really not that bad. I mean, yeah, before God and the light of God, yeah, it's pretty blinding, but compared to that schmuck down the road, yeah, I'm doing better. Or we minimize our sin. Well, yeah, I mean, you could call it greedy, but I was really just trying to be, you know, wise. Yeah, you could call it gossip, but I was just sharing prayer requests, whatever, right? And so we minimize, and so we, what we do is we actually shrink the cross. And the gospel stays small. But this is what we got to do. We got to let the light be the light. We got to let it be strong and bright. We got to let it be fluorescent. And we got we got to not pretend we are the light. We got to stop pretending we are better than we are, friends. Because verse 9 is the answer. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where does the light come and not obliterate us? Confession. The progressive ideology today says, celebrate your sin. The Pharisees say, concentrate on his sin. The atheist says, what sin? And the voice crying in the wilderness, the Apostle John says, confess sin. I was looking at Psalm 32 as a companion passage for us. I just want to read this from the psalmist because we hear in this language, this is what it looks like. Psalm 32, verses 1 and following, 1 to, 1 to 5. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Look at this. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And then he says this, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Confession is deciding I'm not going to cover up any of it. Where did the first cover up happen? They covered themselves. Who's going to cover up the darkness in you and in the darkness in me? Randy Alcorn was asked one time, how would you define repentance? Because there was a question that came in from a, a reader about a situation in their church, and his response was strong, and I want to read those sentences to you today. He says this, repentance is more than reciting well-calculated words with a view toward minimizing our losses. Repentance, when it is genuine, is in fact not accompanied by calculation at all. It's utterly vulnerable. It confesses more than what's been found out. It never withholds information in the hope that one's image and reputation will be preserved. It puts itself at the mercy of others. It is not to presume it does not presume to direct or to, to control others. We start in the Christian life, God, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, help. And then we get churched into a culture where we just pretend. And we come on Sunday morning, how are you doing? I'm great. We're all doing great, I guess. Like, nobody in here is doing bad. That's amazing. Well, when have you mentored me? Like, 
I, I mean, like, the ultimate spiritual audit for the Moffat family right now, like, how, okay, so we have our doctrinal theology. We all agree on this. You want to know where, where the Moffat family is, like, really, like, it's like a diagnostic of how we're really doing? The weekly who needs a car what day conversation. <laughs> Four drivers, two cars. I'm not as far along in the, my discipleship with Jesus as I thought I am. And I'm also getting more uh, athletic and better health with my biking skills, okay? I mean, the reason I brought that up is because we were having conflict, and this kid needed to be there, and this person needs to be there, and, um, you know, there's all this stuff going on, and suddenly my kids are asking, you know, yeah, I can drive you somewhere. You can, you can pay me on this Uber app. I'm like, with my car, I'm not paying you, okay? Um, <laughs> great business idea. I'm not going there. Um, and we had just had a doozy, and, and one of my daughters said, texted me and mom and said, you know, my attitude's been really crummy about this. And I was spending time with Jesus, and I'm realizing there's entitlement in me. And there's demands I put from my own selfishness. And I'm reading this text, and I'm thinking about this morning. And I'm like, this is what God wants. He wants me to say, I was wrong. I was wrong in behavior, but I was wrong in motive. I wanted the right thing, but I wanted it for the wrong reasons. You know how confusing that is in pastoral ministry sometimes? I want the church to be great. Why? So people think I have a good church. Right thing, wrong heart. I want this family thing that we're doing. I want it to be amazing. Why? So people can look at me and say, you're so good at leading your family. Friends, the, the way out of the, the light of God is not to pretend it's not there. It's not to pretend we're better than we are. It's to confess our sin. And there's four subjective experiences that come from confession. Number one, Psalm 32, how blessed is the man, how happy is the person whose transgression is forgiven. You're just happy. One litmus test for our lives is, do we just have joy in the grace of God? Or is that training wheel stuff? I've moved on to the big stuff now. Friends, it'll, it was by grace, it is by grace, and it will be by grace alone. Number two, Jesus says, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. You're not loving well? Maybe you haven't experienced the grace well. Go back to the grace of God. Number three, John says that fellowship with one another is a result of a confessed community. You know, it's amazing what happens when we see people in the church in need. Isn't it cool how people rally around people when they're in need? It's amazing. I see this happening all over the church. Someone has a need, boom, they're on it. But then we, we pretend we don't have need. There's more needs than medical needs. There are spiritual needs. There is uh, emotional needs. There's relational needs. And John says, when we confess, we have fellowship with one another. And number four, the last experience that's available, don't you just want to feel clean? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. That's justification. We love that one. We don't talk much about the second one. And to cleanse us. Don't you want to feel clean? Don't you want to feel bathed and cleansed and baptized and washed? That's what's available this morning. So the way forward as a church, if we're going to have this embodied community, if we're going to have this objective doctrine, which we love, the gospel, and we're going to be a culture that's gospel-centered, it's to live lives of confession. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for uh, this church family. 
Thank you for what you're doing in people's lives. Thank you that you're touching people by the grace of God, one heart at a time. God, thank you for the men and women of this church family. We pray your blessing over them, God. We pray that this would be, a, even today, a Sunday where we would see greater gospel reality in our church because we're learning that we don't have to pretend. We don't have to excuse. We don't have to justify. We don't have to minimize what grace has already forgiven. And so, God, I pray your grace would be strong this morning. We need a fresh work of grace. We need a fresh work of grace in our own lives. We need it in this community. We need it in the church. God, there's a major guilt problem in our culture today. No one knows what to do with their shame. Thank you that at the cross, you despised the shame and you put it to open shame. You triumphed over all of it. You nailed it to the cross and you disarmed the powers and the rulers and the authorities by the precious blood of Jesus. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time. Thank you for what you're doing in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, as we go to communion this morning, um, you're gonna, we're going to do this relatively quick because we actually get to practice two sacraments this morning. We get to do communion, and then we're going to do baptisms. So my encouragement to you is, as you grab your uh, elements at the table, let this be a time to just be honest with Jesus. Jesus, I need to confess some things. <laughs> Jesus, my attitude's been rotten this week. Jesus, the way I spoke to so-and-so, that was harsh. Jesus, I lied. Let's just say it to Jesus. And let's experience the grace for our real stuff, our real pain, our real problems. So please grab your elements and I'll lead us from the front in just a couple minutes. Psalms this week. If 
you got the reference, you can remind me where it is. I do not know. But it said, Lord, if you marked iniquities, who could stand? And the rhetorical answer to that question is nobody. None of us. And then it says, but with you, God, there is forgiveness. And then it goes on to say, as far as the east is from the west. And so because of the precious blood of Jesus, the, the very thing First John says, this is the body and the blood. This is the cleansing agent. We're cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So we thank you, God, for the body of Christ. We eat this bread in remembrance of you this morning. And we thank you for the blood of Christ. It's what we need more than anything. We need that cleansing power that comes. Make us clean. Cleanse us this morning in fresh ways. May we experience your grace and we drink to the glory of God. Let's stand together and we're going to sing and then we're going to have a couple baptisms to end our time. Thanks, Becca and Eric. Uh, Raven and Maria, come on up. The rest of you guys can uh, be seated. And uh, if anyone else wants to be baptized and you're here this morning and you thought, I want to confess and I want to be cleansed, come on up. And got a couple, got a youth pastor, got some dads. Come on up, Maria. I'll let you stand up here and uh, share a little bit. And uh, you got your friend Chris, which is great. It's good to see you. Good morning. Yeah, glad you're here. Been fun getting to know you the last couple of months. Yeah. Share a little bit with the church what's on your heart. And put that mic up nice and high. Okay. My name's Maria. I've been in Sisters for like 10 years now. Um, I always knew I should live my life by God and always had a piece of me that wanted to, but I never took the steps or time to fulfill that part in my life. Recently, my life took an unexpected turn and I hit rock bottom and was in crisis. Um, and that was when I knew I needed God's saving. I realized I couldn't live my life without him, and I couldn't be the best fiance, sister, friend, and daughter if I didn't have a relationship with God first. Mm -hmm. I've had the most amazing people guide me through this journey, and for that, I'll always be thankful. 
through all of this, I now know that Jesus died for my sins and still loved me fully when I was at rock bottom. Awesome. So proud of you. That's great. Raven and uh, Team Miller. All right, yeah. Team, team Miller is strong this morning. Always strong, but... Raven, you want to share a few things? Oh, Dustin, you guys had an interview. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't know you guys had an interview. Oh, please. I love interviews. Anybody else fired up right now? <laughs> this is amazing. I think we have, especially as a church, we underestimate what baptism is. It is amazing. So your guys' homework, your guys' too. Read Romans 6 in 1 Peter chapter 3 and 4. This is amazing, and it makes me want to cry. We went to high school together. This is awesome. <laughs> Raven, you've been in this community for a while, and I've had the privilege to help disciple you alongside your amazing parents. And it, baptism, it's not the washing off of dirt, but it's a pledging to God of a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. We get to do that. And in that, First Peter 4 says that, man, we've had enough of the previous life. We, we've been living that life long enough, and you guys are deciding that you want to live a life worth living. So Raven, I'd love to hear from you. Why, why is it that you want to live this new life that's worth living? What made you come to this amazing decision? Because he makes me a better person and gives me purpose and meaning. Awesome, Raven. That's amazing. So good. We're ready? All right. We're ready. Maria, let's go. Maria, it's super awesome to see God's work in your life, and it's been fun sitting with you in Austin talking about life and faith and marriage, and just want you to know I'm super proud of you. This is a very joyful uh, day, and I know Jeff and Corey as well and the whole family, so, and the whole Sisters Community Church family. Look at all these people out here. Just soak it in real quick. Isn't that cool? So, it's a joy to baptize you, sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, we actually do have towels here. Good to know. Someone asked me earlier, so. All right, Raven. Probably cross your arms if you want. Raven, it's been awesome being able to disciple you along your parents and that you actually want to make this decision to follow Jesus even before you go to high school and, or before you go to college, graduating high school, going to college. I hope you're graduating high school but how you're setting yourself up for success in your walk with Jesus. It's encouraging to all of us, so go ahead and look out if you want to all the congregation. You're not just, yep, yep. And I say that and have you do that because you're actually not alone, because we're your family here, and you got even more family in Corvallis, the body of Christ. So on your confession that you want to follow Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. When's the last time you had a morning like this morning? And I was thinking as we were doing this, um, you know, four months ago, we didn't have any kids, let alone dedicating them and, uh, and baptisms. What a, what a, a beautiful, beautiful morning. You know, we have a phrase in the church, yeah, amen. I, I just can't help but think God, angels, everybody else, he's just smiling from heaven, right? We have, a, we have a phrase in the church from the cradle 
to the grave. And I almost hesitate using that because uh, the last thing we're going to do this morning is to pray for Ron and Joanne Roberts, wherever you might be. Would you come up here? Uh, <clears throat> yes, come on up here. So when I say from the cradle to the grave, I don't mean that... Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I don't know about Ron, but so. But uh, Ron and Joanne have been such precious people to Sisters Community Church for such a long time. Yeah. And uh, and uh, certainly precious to me as I've been here for the last six, seven years. And uh, uh, I just love these two and love the encouragement they've been to me. And I know many of you feel the same way. And well, they've. Uh, sold their house and they're going off to Arizona and uh, it's not closed yet <laughs> <laughs> spoken like a true real estate man right <laughs> so but uh, as we think about our benediction I wonder if you'd all stand with me because this benediction this morning is for Ron and Joanne um, we want the Lord to bless them and keep them and shine on them and use them in ways that is just so incredible. So um, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Father, I pray for Ron and Joanne as you would use them as you've used them here. So many times uh, their relationship has been such a light and darkness, such a encouragement in, in times of discouragement, such a place of hope, Lord, where there's disappointment. So I'd ask you to give them in the days ahead power and influence and peace and good health. And Lord, may their face shine on others in the same way that your face shines on them. So give them traveling mercies. And as they go, and I'm sure we'll see them again, God, you'd watch over them and use them for the church that they'll find themselves in. May they be an encouragement there as they've been here. And we ask in Christ's name, amen. And amen. amen. Blessings, you too. Love you. Church, enjoy your day. Go out and bless someone, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>